Awesome. Uh, well, awesome. Well, thank you so much um, for the invitation to discuss this paper. Um, as you've just seen, there is a lot of really cool stuff in this paper, a lot to think about, a lot of things uh, potentially to discuss. Um, so before going there, this is an ESG paper, I wanted to briefly think about kind of where we've been in ESG, and as if you just saw, you know, kind of if you think back to the beginning, the message was don't do ESG. Um, of course, Milton Friedman wrote his famous essay, what should firms be doing? They should be trying to maximize profits. And then we did move on, so you know, lots of people argued without theory, saying, well, maybe we should be doing ESG because of shareholder preferences. Um, really kind of tough to really formally write it down, but Luigi wrote down uh, a great paper showing in certain cases it would totally make sense for firms to be doing ESG for shareholders. And now we've got this paper that says, look, we should be doing ESG. We should be doing it because of employee preferences. Uh, and Tim was just here uh, <laughs> telling us all that message. Now, what I kind of like about this progression is if you pay attention, you can see we've kind of come full circle here, right? Ooh, where did it go? There we go. Because Friedman, of course, didn't say, don't do ESG because I hate the environment. He said, don't do ESG because it's not about making profits. Now, in this paper, firms don't care about the environment. They just want to make profits. They're going to do ESG for the firms, and they're going to end, or sorry, to maximize profits for their employees, and we're going to grow the overall economy. So this is actually ESG Friedman can be behind. We've gone from kind of Friedman to Bequade, um, growing the economy with ESG in the process. So, the paper has a lot. I'd say kind of three main components. First, there's this big firm survey um, that's really interesting, um, and I'm just going to skip it. Uh, the really relevant result here is about a quarter of firms say they think about ESG in terms of employee retention. Um, could be another paper. Lots of great stuff in it. There's this job seeker survey that's going to be very key to the paper, where they go, they partner with a website where you go to kind of find job postings and apply to them. Um, and then there's going to be a theory, a structural model, a massive data set uh, that they're going to use to calibrate everything. Um, definitely a lag here. No, there we go. Okay, so in terms of the survey, this is what they're going to find. People like ESG, not as much as from work from home, maybe about half as much, but definitely more than non-wage amenities. Um, really is a lag here with the clicker. Sorry, guys. Let's see, we go. Uh, yes, uh, and so then uh, if you run regressions with both wages and ESG, you can compare these coefficients. You'll find ESG is about 100 or about 400 hay ice. That's like 10% of average monthly salary. This is a big number. Uh, if you go into demographics, where is this coming from? This is coming from kind of the high-skilled workers, the educated workers, the liberal workers. If you look at kind of proxies for unskilled, they don't care about ESG. Uh, they're going to run a model where workers care about wages, they care about ESG. Um, they're going to assume the unskilled workers don't care about ESG based on that. Firms are just maximizing profits, they're going to have some market power. Wages are going to be lower than the marginal product of labor. You know, you put all of this together and you get total economic output is increasing in ESG. So this is the high productivity firms are going to be the ones who do ESG. They are going to attract more high productivity um, workers. In the estimates, they get about a 70 basis point increase in the total economy. The wage differential is going to increase by about 4%. Total worker utility is going to increase by about 5%. Um, let's see. There we go. So first off, this is a really thought-provoking paper. Very interesting to think about. Um, just a wide variety of, of, you know, kind of different observations, tools being used, um, things like that. I think the question of ESG is non-wage compensation is uh, an important question and one that's see, received almost no attention. You know, we've got a, an ocean of ESG papers, um, and I think this paper deserves a lot of credit for really thinking hard about this question, highlighting it, forcing us to think about kind of its importance. Um, now, this is a big paper, so 123 pages is what I was sent, um, and 123 dense pages. There is a lot of stuff in those appendices. There are two surveys, two survey designs, big data sets, theories, and a structural model. You could pick any of these and do a full discussion. So I am going to focus largely on the survey design of the employee-employee survey. Uh, first off, because I think you know, surveys are becoming a lot more important, and as, as survey usage becomes more important, 
it becomes important to talk about how we design these surveys optimally, you know, similar to econometrics and data. Uh, these are tools. Um, but also because it is a key parameter to the model in terms of the estimates that come out of it. And then I've got some kind of broad conceptual questions about how this is being modeled. <clears throat> there we go. Okay, so what you can see here is, sorry, okay, this is kind of the base finding, right? So there's ESG uh, relative to these other things, but this is obfuscating, uh, let's see if we can get it to go. Nope. Okay, but this is obfuscating a lot of heterogeneity here, right? So you look at, you know, the E's and the, the non-wages, there's a lot of stuff going on. So just, you know, one broad question when it finally pops up is what's the right way to be thinking about it? Should we be combining this together in the model if there are like 50 different non-wage amenities with different distributions? Is that important? Is that not important? Um, I'm not sure. And that's what you were supposed to be looking at. Um, Oh, we can see, sorry, this is really lagging a lot. There we go. Okay, so if we look here, let's first start by talking the top three, kind of the E, S, and G. What you can see is people care a lot about E, not really S and G. See, this is broadly true. This has been found a lot of places. When you talk about sustainable you know, finance, when you talk about green investing, uh, when you talk about ESG, to a lay person, it's all about the environment. Now, the certifications here are a lot bigger. For the moment, let's ignore those, because I've got some concerns with those magnitudes that we'll come back to. So let's focus on the, the ESG. That's roughly the average. So you can see this is kind of, ah, we'll see if it, uh, no. Let's see, so ESG is, uh, oh, we're going the wrong way. There we go, ESG is definitely better than things like wellness, daycare, personal development, kind of sort of similar to like an in-office gym or mentoring. Uh, a little bit less than, uh, definitely, sorry, a ton less than work from home, a bit under, say, a pension or a food allowance, things like that. I, I don't know, this broadly seems sensible to me in terms of kind of relative orderings. Um, but for the paper, what really you need is kind of the wage differential, kind of how much you'd be willing to give up in terms of wages. And the survey suggests about 10%. And I'm gonna point out some potential concerns where I think that the survey might be understating responsiveness to wage, overstating um, kind of responsiveness to ESG, which would move this number up a little bit too high. I wanna think both about what the question that's actually being asked is, um, and then also maybe some possible salience effects in the survey design. So what is the task? So the task is you're a job searcher, you go to this website and you say there's this new AI we're gonna give you fake job listings, answer these job listings so we can give you better real listings further on. Now, what's the potential issue there is you are now being asked to respond, give responses to calibrate to an algorithm. So you've kind of built in a beauty contest problem where you shouldn't respond necessarily with how you feel about a job posting, but how you think the algorithm will optimally update and give you better real stuff later on. Now, I think this is gonna be particularly acute for wages. So think about what happens if you happen to get a listing with a high wage. And if you got that as an offer, you'd be really happy about that. But you, this is an algorithm that you're calibrating and you may say, no, I'm not that interested because you know that your wage will be miscalibrated and what you're getting shown in the future, you'd never get an interview for that job. <clears throat> also, we're talking about job postings. and That's not really what we want. We want kind of the job offer, how would you take it or not? Now, posted wage is just the start of a bargaining problem, and a pretty noisy one in an online job posting, um, but that's also not gonna be true with other amenities, right? If they list, you've got an in-office gym, they're not gonna take it away, they've got an in-office gym. So this likely is gonna mute kind of the wage effects in general. <clears throat> now, why is it that we're here? So we're here because they wanted to find a place that they could incentivize truthful reporting. Um, and so why is it that you know, that is such an important thing? And I'd say it's kind of our fault, right? So you're in an audience of economists or finance folks, and they're gonna start talking about incentives here. And it's largely gonna be based on kind of intuition from an economic model, gut instinct. And now we've got a really large survey design literature that kind of says, this is where incentives make sense, make things better. This is where they make it worse. This is where they don't tend to matter. 
Now this setting, we're just trying to get people to tell us their opinions. It turns out people really want to tell you their opinions, if they're able to. Um, and so it isn't, doesn't make a ton of sense to try to put truthful incentivizing here. And so we're kind of examining not quite the question we want to get at, to get at these truthful incentives, even though the survey design literature says we probably shouldn't need to worry about it. Though I should state, this may well be optimal for the authors because the uh, you know, structural estimation referee probably will ask that question anyways. Um, <laughs> Okay, so last bit about the survey design. So this is what you can see. See, they basically tried to replicate job postings. Lots of different words, lots of different categories. They randomize everything. So that's really nice. That's one example. Here's another. And so, <coughs> excuse me. The, um, but what you get in a kind of a survey design like this is people are gonna be paying attention to some things and not other things, right? There's a lot of information. You're not paying attention to all of it. This is true in the real world as well, too. You kinda of know if you post a job posting, people aren't gonna pay attention to all of it. So in a design like this, the salience is gonna be really important and kind of how it's manipulated because you want there to be kind of how people will actually pay attention to it, but you don't want it to be driven by how you present the information. Because if there's an underlying effect and you manipulate the salience, you're gonna overstate that effect relative to other things. Now, my concerns here, remember the certifications that were like double everything else? Well, there's a massive picture here, right? Like what's salient on the screen? This huge B. Um, and this is true in the real world. You go to Morningstar, what's salient on the page? The big five stars at the top. That's what they want you to pay attention to. But so I'm a little worried that that's just kind of a salience manipulation. And the other thing is, if you noticed, wages are really hard to see here. Everything's under these big, bold headings. Here's wages in very small to font at the top. It actually took me a while to find that. So I was a little bit worried that that could, again, lead to kind of some attenuation in wages. Now, what's so cool with surveys, though, is maybe I'm wrong about all of that, and we can just go out and run those things and see if they matter or not. Now, first off, you know, based on my incentive comment, I don't think this needs to be run on Catho. I think this could be run on a similar population that's gonna be easy and cheap to get ask, um, access to. So first thing to do, rerun the base survey, get the same results. As long as that happens, we'll go and test all the stuff I just talked about. Um, first thing is ask the right question for the model, which I think is something like, if you had this offer, would you take it? Or you know, how would you feel about it? Something like that. <clears throat> And then I also think we should be asking this in a few different ways. You can just directly say, would you be willing to give up wages in return for ESG? I think people would probably be able to answer that. And then, you know, I'm not totally sure why this paper didn't take conjoint, which is kind of the standard method um, in this literature to kind of get monetary equivalents where you get shown kind of combinations of things. You say what's uh, the one you prefer. That's kind of the standard here. So I don't know, you may as well just run it see if things are similar, see if they're different. And then of course, all the salient stuff I talked about, change it, get rid of the picture, see if it changes anything, um, make the money a little bit more salient, see what happens. Um, no, there we go. Uh, and last, just some kind of broad questions. You know, in this case, workers like ESG, and you get this distribution, but this is probably true for a lot of non-wage amenities. And, you know, is this an ESG model? Is this a non-wage amenity model? Um, if there are non-wage amenities that unskilled workers like, but high-skilled workers like, does that destroy the economy? Um, if there are hundreds of non-wage amenities with different distributions among workers, uh, what happens? Um, I have no idea, but I think they could be kind of interesting to think about in the paper. And then finally, you know, it is an ESG paper. Typically with ESG, we talk about, does it make the world better off? Um, you know, I don't know, maybe a little bit, thinking about kind of outcomes in terms of actually uh, saving the environment and the planet. So um, thank you again for the invite to discuss. Those are the things, uh, very cool paper, really enjoyed reading it.